But I want to share with you a particular message, and it's called, uh, It's Not My Ability, But My Response to God's Ability That Counts. And uh, it's, it's something I'd shared in the morning uh, some weeks back or a couple of months back. Uh, and it's, I got caught up into Corrie Ten Boom. I read her life story again. I've read it a couple of times, The Hiding Place. And it just seems like it was a biography that really stirred me about faith and about being able to endure through challenging times. And I'm sure if you haven't been listening that Corrie Ten Boom uh, was 41 years of age uh, when her, her sister Betsy and with her father Casper, that's a funny name, isn't it, Casper, in Holland in a place called Harlem, which is in Holland, were actually hiding Jews because of the Nazi Germans occupation. And they, they were arrested and they were taken to the concentration camps and her father Casper died within 10 days. And uh, her and her sister Betsy were incarcerated in this concentration camp and it was so infested with fleas that the prison guards wouldn't come in because of the infestations. And I just love the attitude because it was Corey and Betsy that says, thank the Lord for the fleas that we can have Bible study in privacy without being interrupted. Isn't it amazing how we can all face the same problems, but it's how you deal with it in your mind and your spirit that makes a difference. And her sister Betsy would die in that prison. And it's amazing how you can go through so much and yet have such an impact. And when I got saved uh, in those early 70s, mid 70s, uh, Corey Ten Boom was really at the height uh, with her books and speaking and, and ministry that area there. And she really had an impact. And just refreshing her story really touched me. And that this is her statement. She says, it's not my ability, but my response to God's ability that counts. And when I was thinking of this, I thought about Esther, and I love the story. And I just want to read a couple of verses in the book of Esther, chapter 2, verse 5 to 8. And it said this, In the fortress of Susa, there is a Jewish man named Mordecai, a Benjamite, who was a Jew. And he had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the other captives when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon took King Jeconiah of Judah into exile, which is the last group that they took captive. And Mordecai was the legal guardian of his cousin, Hadasha, literally his uncle's daughter that is Esther, because she didn't have a father or a mother. And the young woman had a beautiful figure, was extremely good looking. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai had adopted her as his own daughter. And, when, and at the king's command, an edict became public knowledge, verse eight, many young women were gathered at the fortress of Susa under Haggai's care. And Esther was also taken to the palace and placed under the care who was in charge of the women. Now, I find the story of Esther absolutely uh, fascinating but it's not as romantic as it sounds because this man would force himself on every woman that he wanted. And he had so many women, it'd be over a year before he went and slept each night with a different woman. They had no say, they had no, no, no way to object. They were just forcibly taken and brought into the king's harem. And even after he'd slept with them, and there were many hundreds, and he decided he didn't want you, you wouldn't be released, but you'd be put in what they called the second harem, would you be held forever because you'd been with the king. It was just terrible, it was just inhumane, and it was just terribly wrong. It's nothing worse than the slavery is what it really is. But I love the story of Esther, and I don't think that she is talked about enough as a champion in the faith for God. And if ever there's someone who I think champions this very statement of Corey Ten Boom, it's Esther. When I think of the statement, it's not my ability, but my response to God's ability that counts, that really speaks to me. So many times we are so obsessed or so caught about the position we're in in life that we miss out in the fact that God wants to use the way you are being held to reach out and touch people in a broader aspect. This is exactly what Corey Ten Boom believed. Even though she was facing the inhumanity of the incarceration where both her father and her sister would die, she still held to the belief that there was something bigger than her own personal discomfort. It was about her message that she would share to many other people. I saw such a great reflection, such a great connection between her and Esther. If I think of Esther, I thought of a couple points. Number one is this. Esther, to me, believed in the hidden power that God had in her. We as Christians have got to believe in the God who is within us. We've got to believe in the God who is in us. Now, the name Esther, now I know straight away when we think of the name Esther, we think of it in the Persian heritage. And in the Persian heritage, we remember it as the word star. 
in actual fact, the word Esther in Persian is Setura, S-E-T-O-R-A, and that's where they get the word star from. But in the Hebrew language, when they talk about the word Esther, they talk about the three root letters, which is S-T-R, S-T-R. And with the S-T-R, it means to hide, it means to conceal, it literally means to be hidden. So in the Hebrew, the word Esther would literally mean to be hidden. Now, the word Esther wasn't her real name because that's a Persian name. Her real name was Hadasha. And the word Hadasha, as you know, or maybe don't know, it means myrtle. But what happens, Jews were a persecuted people. Jews had been picked up, their nation had been destroyed, and they had been transferred to a foreign land. And this was a continuance from Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, it says Mordecai was one of those who was uprooted and taken from his land. And it tells us that the Jews hid their nationality because of the persecution. In fact, the key man that worked for the king of the Persians was a man called Haman. And Haman calls himself Nagite. Well, the very word Agite is from the king Agag. And king Agag was the king of the Amalekites. And it goes all the way back to when Samuel killed him on the battlefield because Saul had spared him. I think it's 1 Samuel 15. And you wouldn't believe this, but that man, Haman, who was second in the land, still held a grudge to the Jewish people for something that had happened hundreds of years earlier. It's amazing how many times we allow cultural things that happened hundreds of years ago to affect us today and how we react with other people. Even today, we see things that have happened culturally hundreds and hundreds of years ago being a poison in people today that is just spewing out into others. It doesn't mean that we're not responsible for things that have happened. But what it also means is this. We've got to learn to deal with things effectively and properly through the cross. And we as Christians have got to be a testimony. We've got to be a testimony of us being born again, not of this world, but of that which is to come. So the Jews were a persecuted people. So the very meaning of the word Esther that Mordecai had given her was meant you're meant to be hidden. You are to hide who you are. You are to hide your race. You are to hide your nationality. Today, and thank God today, we are so more open about our nationalities. And I think that's wonderful. There was a day when people were told or were forced to forget their native tongue or to forget their native heritage. And I think that's a great tragedy. And a lot of that has to do with the Christian missionaries of time gone by. The Christian missionaries of years gone by was that when you came into a land and when you preached the gospel of Christ and when they got converted, they had to become westernized. It wasn't enough they became Christian, they had to become westernized. They had to lose all reference to the culture, they had to lose all reference towards the native tongue, they had to lose all connections. And this is a great tragedy that happened in our world's history. The situation is this. It didn't matter who you were or where you're from, everybody experienced certain things no matter who you were. I mean, uh, very lightly, not compared to others. My, par my parents were what they called 10 quid pomps, okay? 10 quid pomps. And what that meant was, was that from the years of 1950 up until about 1968, 50, is that the Australian government was encouraging Europeans to come over to Australia to help build up the population. And so the Australian government would subsidise how they got here whether it's by boat or whether it's by plane, they only had to pay 10 quid, like $10, or more like $5 in our currency. And if they had just pay their five Australian dollars or 10 quid, because we had that sort of money in those days, they could make their way over here from the mainland. So my parents didn't want to fly, which might have taken four different steps. They went by ship, which probably took them six weeks, but they got here. And they were called 10 quid poms. Now, I tried to figure out what the word pom meant, okay? Pom or pommy. I used to think for years it meant prisoners of Mother England. That's what I thought it meant. Prisoners of Mother England. Because that's part of the English heritage. I used to think that there was a large percentage of Irish who made up our convicts, but it wasn't. The Irish was lucky to make up even 10%. It was predominantly English who were going through bad economic times. You stole a loaf of bread, you'd be put on a ship, and you'd be brought out to Australia. 
But the word pom actually related towards how the English, when they first arrived at the port in Perth in Western Australia, their cheeks went bright red. And so it was said, look at the English. They got cheeks like pomegranates, bright red. Thus they got called poms. Isn't that interesting? See, it means nothing to you, does it? But anyhow, it's intriguing. Trivia, I know. But I know this. In particular, it was my younger brother. He came from the schools in England. Now, you have to imagine that when my parents came from a place around Newcastle, around about there, don't ask me to be totally accurate. My mum will do that. But where they came from, life was a bit different in the way in which the roads all seemed to be sealed and the way in which all the street lights worked, especially how the plumbing worked. They called it the lavatories. When they came over to Australia and they came out here, when my dad asked, where is the lavatory? They said, it's just what they call the outbox or to be crude, they call it the thunder box in the backyard. It was just this little tiny shed that had no plumbing, but this huge bucket that would be collected once a week by the well, we used to call him the dunny man. He'd come along here, and swing it over his shoulder and collect it. Could you imagine what it was like for the English proper people coming over here into the crudeness of this nation in the very early 60s? When my brother, he's seven years older than me, went to school, even a public school, he had to wear a cap, he had to wear a coat, he had to wear a tie, his little shorts, and his long socks. That was normal for England. Could you imagine his first day when he went to an Australian school? Now, I was, went to school. I was born in Australia, even though it doesn't sound like it. I was born in Australia in 62. When we went to school, I didn't wear shoes to school until I went to grade eight. From grade one to seven, it was just bare feet. Was anybody else? Like, Shane? Not even you. That's right, you weren't there. That's how it was for us. It was bare feet. And it wasn't because we were poor. It was because that's how it was, bare feet. This was Australia. So could you imagine when my brother went to school? He went to school in his little coat, his little tie, his little hat, his shoes and his socks. Oh, I tell you what, they took the mickey out of him. And I tell you what, they took a mickey out of all of the English being over here. What I'm trying to say is that our nation has been birthed on so many different cultures. And with those cultures has been many different biases. And with those bias has been many different prejudices. And with those prejudices have been many different hurts. We've heard all different words and all different things that are used. But here's the issue. We as Christians are not of that. We as Christians, as what Paul says, are aliens to this world. We are meant to be different. We're not meant to find our identity in the nation in which we were born. We're not meant to find our identity in the culture in which we've been shaped. But rather, we are meant to be of the body of Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul would said, I'm only passing through. We are aliens in this world because my kingdom is that which is to come. Now, you have to understand what it's like for the Jewish people. The second in charge was a man called Haman who held on to a hereditary thing that goes all the way back to the Jewish people where King Agag was killed. Instead of him calling himself an Amalekite, which is a people, he called himself an Agite. He related towards the king that was butchered by the prophet Samuel. And he had sworn, even though he had not experienced it, he had sworn, even though his father had not experienced it, he had sworn, even though his father's father had not experienced it, he had sworn revenge on all the Jewish people. And so the Jewish people would hide their identity. So Mordecai, who adopted his uncle's daughter, said, we will not call you Hadasha, which means myrtle, but we'll use the Persian name meaning star in the Hebrew term, which means hidden. You will hide, but shine. You will hide, but shine. To me, that's something that's so powerful that we as Christians are meant to have something within us that to many might think is hidden, that is meant to shine. The first step she had to understand was this. She had to keep her identity hidden. The second step was this. She realized that the Jewish people were in hiding, but there was such a time that God would call someone to bring about a change. We live in a society right now in which it seems in many ways that there's almost an anti-church and anti-Christian feeling. 
It almost seems like there is one rule for sports, there's one rule to entertainment, and there's one rule for shopping, and there's one rule for adventure, and there's another rule for church. In fact, in the American politics, there's a certain party in the Democrats which are so anti-church that in many areas, the governors, which is like our premiers, have been taken to court. In fact, there's been three court cases of late where they have said you have got to stop persecuting and closing the churches down and using this as an excuse. Because they see more in the church than what we see in the church. They see that when Christians come together and pray, when Christians come together and unify, when Christians come together and join force, they believe that there is something that needs to be reckoned with. I only wish that we could believe in the church as much as the world believes in the church. The, believe, the world sees the church in a way that they see as threatening. Therefore, they want to work to close it down. And yet we in the church see ourselves as being weak, unimportant, and unnecessary. We need to have more Mordecai's. We need to have more Esther's. We need to have more men and women who believe in the power that God has given us in the body of Christ. I say this, we've got to learn to embrace our destiny. At first, Esther would hide who she was. She would hide her nationality. She would hide her heritage. Yet even though she hid it, she would still stand on the principles of who she was. When the other women were given special food, when the other women were given special beauty treatment, and this beauty treatment was 12 months. And then when they were selected, it'd be another six months of intense treatments. She would not eat their special foods, just like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not eat those foods. She would not go through the special beauty treatments. She would not take the special jewelries and all those sort of things that the other women would take. And yet there was something in her that God had done that made her stand out from all others. Yes, the king took her one night. Yes, the king slept with her, not by any choice of her, but he did this. And yes, the king declared that she would be his. In the midst of God moving, there was pain and suffering. In the midst of God moving, there was injustices. But here's the situation. If we can learn to understand that in every situation, in every circumstance, that if we really understand the bigness of God, God can use the injustices that we experience in life to bring about glory to Him and to the house. Another thing I learned so much about Esther is this. We must allow our inner beauty to shine. It's not how you look on the outside. It's who you are on the inside. We have got to be more than a shallow outlook. I see so many people who are so focused on their outward appearances. The Word of God says the outward beauty is fleeting, it's temporary. But what is inside is what is strong and what lasts and what endures. I love the idea how we can stand strong in God. She is a principled woman. I love the idea that she holds to her principles, that even when others are folding in around her and even when others were taking the king's food and even when others were taking these treatments, she would stand strong and say, I'm not. Even when the king chose her and threw this great party in the great area and he says, reveal to us your heritage, she still held silent. There was a time when she should speak. You know, I heard someone say this about evangelism. Evangelism is not what you say, it's how you live. Evangelism is not what you say, it's how you live. Many a man and many a woman have wrecked their testimony, not by the good words they've spoken, but by the life that hasn't measured up to the words they spoke. You can speak all the right things, and declare all the right ways, and then your lifestyle just does not measure up. Sometimes I think it might help to hold back our words and wait for the right moment and let our life so shine. During this time of COVID-19, oh, Sandra and I have been ministering to all different types of people and it's been absolutely wonderful. And things that could have been terrible, I think have turned out good. Things that have turned out depressing have turned out well. In the midst of a time when people were fearful, in the midst of a time where people were uncertain, in the midst of times when things happened, God was still in control. I think at a time where I could have seen someone who means a lot to me to have been killed in my office because of an emotional, mental breakdown. 
Yet by God's grace and God's mercies, God's hand was there. I think about that gentleman who broke into the office because of a, a mental disposition he was going through and, and praise God for stability now, which is wonderful. But he was in this bad place and, and Pastor Shane had rang me. I always remember that Saturday morning, Pastor Shane. Pastor Shane rang me up and uh, I was just finishing a morning video and I couldn't answer when he first called because I was doing the morning video. And uh, so I'd finished the morning video. I said, what is it, Shane? He says, there's something happening at the church. Your alarms have gone off. The security's called us up. Don't you love our security? They ring us up. They don't come out. They ring us up, okay? So Shane says, I'll meet you in the church car park. So I came down to the church. I had Sandra with me. So I said, well, Sandra, you better stay in the car and just pray. And so I, I, I came out and saw Pastor Shane. I said, well, let's go in. He goes, no, there's something happening. I heard noise and smashing. So, there. so I said, okay. So the police were called. So I said to Shane, let's not wait. Let's go in. And Shane goes, no, let's wait. I said, I'm only going to wait one more minute. <laughs> Shane's such a cool operator. Anyhow, the long story is the situation occurred. And when the gentleman was taken back to the watch house, we did want to be at a minister. And I talked to Pastor Danny, to Pastor Shane and myself. But you know, the way our government's set up now, five, eight years ago, ministers were encouraged to come into the watch house and minister towards those who are incarcerated. Today, ministers are classified as unnecessary. Today in the watch house, they're not allowed to visit. Did you know that? You're not allowed to visit. Ministers are unnecessary. The gentleman was taken into medical treatment because of the imbalance he's experiencing and the emotional breakdown. And I don't know exactly how long he was there for, a week or a bit longer, but he was in this area with, with police on the doors and areas there doing all their treatments. Again, Different people had tried to visit, were not allowed. And ministers are not welcome to visit because what do ministers know in the medical profession? But you know what the irony is? I don't know exactly how long it was. Do you remember, Shane? A week, two weeks. But there was a call to the church. And the call to the church was the head psychiatrist in that area. And he said, we're not having any success. Could that pastor come out, please? Well, when Josiah rang me up and said he got that call, I said, I'll turn the car around and go straight over there. I couldn't wait to turn up there because they're actually saying we need something more than the medical treatment of psychiatrists or the lockup of the prisons. And when we got to go over there, and straight away when I got there, there's these security people, it's like, you're not allowed in. And just as they're about to put the hand, said, you're not allowed to be here, we're doing it here, this psychiatrist ran across, jumped in front between me and them. It was really quite funny and said, leave him alone. He's the pastor. We want him in here. And I went, okay. They stepped aside. And as soon as that door opened, that, you know what that young man did? He saw me. He jumped up, ran, and he hugged me. Forget about COVID-19. He ran up and hugged me. He was crying on my shoulder. He says, I'm so glad you're here. And as I turned around to sit down, I noticed the two security guards and two nurses were peering through the door. And I said, it's okay. They said, okay. And they stepped back. Now, my time there was limited. I don't know, 45 minutes, 50 minutes. And we talked, we prayed, we shared, and it was just a very personable time. It was great. Now, I left there and, and nobody met me as I left. I left there and I came back and Josiah said, well, how did it go? And I said, well, I think it went okay. I said, I think it went all right. We talked, we shared, we prayed. And it was only, I think, that next day or, or whatever, I, I, I think, I'm not totally sure on the recollect, recollection, but I think it was his daughter rang me up and contacted me and said that there was a dramatic change in him. All of a sudden, he was eating. All of a sudden, he was following through the principles. And then in a matter of a week or two weeks, he was moved here. And in the next two weeks, he moved here. And different things happening. I tell you what, in the midst of every problem challenge, God's at work. Well, if that was the only story I had for you, that'd be fantastic. But I got another story. I got another story. This is why I'm kind of celebrating this time. Can you musicians come up? Because I got to finish. So this is just in the last couple of weeks. So about six weeks ago, I had this guy ring me up and said, can I see you? I said, okay, you can see me. He came to see me, he says, do you remember me? Have you ever been in that place where someone says, do you remember me? And you don't remember them? 
I had someone this morning at the door saying, hello, Pastor Sean, do you remember me? And I was like, I don't don't want to disappoint them. So I go, sure, sure, yes. And so it's telling me all these things. I can't remember one thing they're talking about. But I go, sure, sure. They said, I don't understand why Pastor Shane didn't remember me. I said, I don't know, I don't know. What is it with Pastor Shane? I don't know. (laughs) I hope they're not watching this program. Okay, praise God. I don't know. (laughs) That's a true story. So I met with this particular gentleman and I said, he says, it's so good to see you. And I said, yes. He says, oh, it's a great memory. I go, yes. And I said, oh, I don't really remember you. He goes, what? I said, I I really don't remember you. Because yes, you know, blah, blah. I said, yes, you know, blah, blah. Yes, and you know, blah, blah. Yes, well, I'm related to them. I said, yay, but I still don't remember them, okay? You remember my father? Yes, I remember your father. Then you remember me? No, I don't remember you, but I remember your father. So uh, that's happened there. So he began to share some personal challenges. And I won't go into those details because it's personal. So I, I agreed that in the next week or so, I'd meet his partner. So his partner came to see me. And uh, I had a chance to share with her. And she was just very soft and open and tears began to stream down her face. And I said to her, I think it's better you see my wife. It's better woman to woman. You better see my wife. So I, I rang up my wife while she's there. I said, Sandra, would you see this young lady in the next week? She said, yes. So my wife caught up with her. And you know what's so beautiful? My wife rang me up. She said, I just led her to the Lord. She came through for Jesus. There was a beautiful moment in that area. We said, right. It took four weeks for that guy to come and see me again. And the guy came back to see me. In the meantime, uh, his partner's been doing New Believers Pack and going through it and going to some life groups and just ministering. So the guy came back to see me just this other week. And it was good to see him. And he says, um, so how are you? And I said, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? He said, I'm okay. And I said, isn't it wonderful how your partner made a decision for Jesus? Isn't that wonderful? And he went, I don't know. And I said, she has so changed. Have you noticed a change in her? Mm, Not really. I said, there's been so many changes in her life about how she wants to move in grace and mercy and love and unconditioned. Isn't that wonderful? He goes, I don't know. Have you had one of those moments where you just want to go, you know what I'm trying to say? I'm going, well, let me ask you this question. I said, why are you seeing me? Well, well, he says, uh, uh, well, if I went to a psychologist, they're just biased against men. So uh, I thought I'd come to you. So I said, that's a compliment, right? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll support men. <laughs> I said, I hope I support what's right. So he said, yeah, I don't want to go to a psychologist because they'll just say my partner's right and I'm wrong. So I thought I'd come to you. So you've met me, you've met my partner. Now I'm back here. So who's right, who's wrong? I said, oh, buddy. I said, you're off. He goes, what do you mean? I said, you're the problem. You're the problem. I said, but I'm not saying that to put you down because I really care about you and I really want you right. I said, I know you used to know the Lord, but do you know the Lord now? He goes, no. He says, I'm a pagan. I said, you're a what? He said, I'm a pagan. So I said, wicker. Yes. Witch. Yes. You're a witch. Yes. I said, you got one of those little things around your neck? What do you mean? You know, we have crosses, you have pentagrams. You got one of them? He goes, yes, I got two. He pulled them out. I said, okay. So I said, why are you seeing me? What do you mean? I said, well, why aren't you seeing another witch? Why are you seeing me? Why me? I said, I said to him, why do I attract people like you? He goes, what? I said, why do I attract people like you? I said, what is it? Do I have a neon sign on my head that says, come get Sean Hansen? Like, what is it? Why why do I get people like you? I said, seriously, what is it about me that attracts you? He says, well, I I feel I can talk to you. I said, this is what I I think. I said, this is what I think. I said, I think you need a spiritual daddy who needs to give you a bit of a whooping and tell you he loves you and get you in line. He goes, what? I said, I think you need a spiritual daddy that needs to give you a bit of a whooping in love and get you in line. I said, you need to stop this nonsense, get yourself right with God and get in line. 
he had like, I think it looked like a little tea in his eye. And I said, I can't do much for you unless you're prepared to be open. He said, well, I'm a pagan. And I said, well, why don't you challenge your powers against my powers and let's see how it goes. I said, let's do that. You summon up all your powers as a wicker and I'll call upon the Holy Spirit and let's have a spiritual arm wrestle and see what works. I said, because I've dealt with a lot of guys like y'all. And that was the end of the conversation. So my wife talks to me the day later. She said, oh, I was talking to this young lady again. I said, oh, yes. How did it go? She said, well, she said that she wants to come to church on Sunday because, you know, this all happened in the COVID-19, no church is online. I said, oh, that's wonderful. And she said she's going to bring her partner with her. I said, Sandra, he's a wicker. He told me he's a witch. He's not going to come. She said, John, she said he's going to bring him to church. I said, honey, he, he's not going to come to church. Well, guess who turned up at church this morning? He turned up at church. I was so excited. I wanted to hug him, but you're not allowed to do that, Eric. Do you know what I'm trying to say? You can't do that. But I mean, I was excited. It was like, and he was like, it's like, he's like, To the end of the service, I was over there. I said, hi, how you doing? He said, yeah, good. Went real fast. I said, all right. So his partner came down a little bit later. I said, oh, I'm so glad you're in church. He said, oh, yes. I said, I'm so glad your partner's in church. He says, he said he will not come back again. I said, oh, oh. I said, okay, okay. I said, but we'll pray. I said, all right. So after the next service at 9.30, at the end of the service, Sandra says, oh, I just got a text message. I said, well, that's nothing new, sweetheart. She said, no, I just got a text message from blah, blah, that young lady. She said, oh, yes. And I said, she told me that her partner said he won't come back to church again. Well, she says, that's funny. She just said he wants to come along to the life group we've got coming up in a couple of weeks. He wants to come along. I was like, well, who knows how God works? Isn't that right? I mean, smash my doors, take my sword and be a wicker. Okay, I mean, like, who knows what God can do? Isn't that right? Isn't that right? What am I trying to say? And I'm finishing because it's too late already. And if I don't finish fast, Josiah's going to say, Dad, you're no better. See, it's not my ability, but it's my response to God's ability that counts. Sometimes we can't be as loud as we'd like to be. Or sometimes there are other forces that are looking to keep us quiet. But ultimately, if you believe in the God Almighty who works within you, if you believe in the strength He gives you, and if you learn not to succumb towards fear or emotions, if you learn to believe in the faith you have, if you don't get so caught up in what's happening in this world, but rather get caught up in who you're in Christ, you can see things happen. Would you pray for that young man? He's a good young man, and I love him, and I honestly believe that it's really just rebellion. Well, that's what witchcraft is, rebellion. It's really rebellion because of things he's gone through in his childhood. But like I said to him, I said, I need to be your spiritual father and I need to bring you in the ways of the Lord. Would you keep your hearts in prayer for him? Would you do that for me? Hey, would you do that? Would you this week hold him in prayer? He's a good young man. Really, he is. I think he's just trying to use a scare tactic with Christians. You ever seen him? You seen those, those people, they used to be Christians and they got these big antichrist t-shirts. And when you say, hey, what's that? They go like, woo, but they want to wear it boldly. But when you challenge them, they don't want to talk about it. I think it's just like that. They have that big gourd where they're going to stick it to see your reaction. You want to know something? We think that things are tough. You know what's tough? It's going through this without Jesus. We think things are hard. You know what's hard? It's going through this without Jesus. We have each other. We have God. We have faith. We don't have religion. We have a relationship. But greater is He that is, greater is He that is, than He that is, we have a great God and we have a God who's called us to be overcomers. Don't you ever forget that. Thank you, Darren. Don't you ever forget that. Don't you ever ignore that. Can you bow your heads right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray your grace, mercy and favour over each and every one. That we would know, that we would know, that we'd know, that we'd know that the God within us is greater than the God of this age. 
that, Lord, if you were for us, then who could be against us? I pray for that young man and I pray for his salvation. I pray against the spirit of darkness that's looked to take his life. I pray, Almighty God, that through love, not through argument, but through love, through the authority found in Christ Jesus, those walls be pulled down because I know, Lord, this young man is hurting. And I know, Lord, that you are the balm that heals. You're the anointing, Lord, that breaks the yoke. You're the peace, Lord, in the midst of a storm. You, Lord, are the answer when life is throwing out so many questions. And I speak this, Lord, over this man's life, over everyone's life, over that gentleman, Almighty God, that had that breakdown in his mind and his emotions and feelings. I'm praying, Almighty God, that even right now you're ministering to him. I know, Almighty God, that he loves you. I know, Lord, he went through a place of confusion. But I know this, Almighty God, that his, his, his name is written on the palm of your hand and you're ministering to him. You're speaking life to him. And Father, even as he may well be listening to this program right now, I want you to know, my friend, friend, that we love you, we embrace you, and we celebrate you, we speak God's hand over you, and I want to see the day and the time to come that you better come here and testify about what you did and about what God's done. And I see you, I visualize you here on this stage with me, sharing and testifying to the goodness of God. And you will be loved, you'll be celebrated, you'll be blessed, and you'll be embraced. And I thank you, that's the redemptive work of the cross. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, whether you're watching online right now, whether it's delayed you're watching, whether you're here right now. If you don't know Jesus, you're away from the Lord, say this prayer. Say, Jesus, I ask you, I invite you to come into my heart, into my life now. I repent of all my sins and all my wrongs and I acknowledge my need to be saved. I declare that in Jesus' name. I am a Christian. Blessed to those, Lord, who prayed. Blessed to those, Lord, who proclaimed. Blessed to those, Lord, who received your word. In Jesus' name, 